Thanks, Mina, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, Mina set me up perfectly for talking about uh, taking what she's taught us already and thinking through how we can actually use that to really help us personalize treatment and think about different strategies. I know this is what we all want, and the idea is we want to be able to take some sort of microbiome genetic response and think about all the different drugs we have on our shelves and put it through some magic machine that leads to some personalized treatment strategy. And we've been talking about this for 10 or 15 years, I think, of this idea, and we haven't gotten there yet. And it's, I, to me, I'm personally a bit disappointed that we haven't gotten there yet, but we are getting a lot closer. And I think what Mina set us up talking about is that we first need to understand who to use the treatments that we have that are very effective and when to use them. But this concept of figuring out which drugs are gonna work for particular people is the holy grail that I think we need to continue push towards, but we aren't quite there yet. But this is certainly what everybody's thinking about and really pushing towards. And I'll show you that there's one leap forward from one study that I'll show you that I think tells us that there is real hope that we are making progress here. So I'll talk about, uh, further talk about risk stratification leading us towards different treatment strategies. And then we'll talk about matching the right treatment to the right patient. So personalized treatment doesn't need to be some magical test that we do. Now that we have multiple different classes of biologics, multiple drugs within those classes, in combination or not in combination, new oral drugs coming out, we actually have ways that we can personalize treatment. It's not a lab test that we can necessarily do to do that, but we have the ability to be thoughtful about what we've got and, 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 and matching them to the right patients. So the first part is selecting the right patients for the right treatment. And a fundamental problem that we have in our field that I think we all need to help move forward is that we wait for our patients to become sick enough to use our best drugs. If you, look about, if you look at all the studies that have done for every biologic drug, patients always do better earlier in the course of their disease. There's nothing magical about that. The problem is once we wait too long, patients are getting sicker, they're developing complications, both with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis that make it harder to respond to these treatments. So we, we really have to stop this reactive response to our patients getting sicker. I don't mean reactive, proactive, and therapeutic drug monitoring. I mean reactive and proactive in how we're thinking about treating our patients and not waiting for them to raise the flag that they're so sick, but for us trying to look into the future to understand who are the patients that will get sick that we can stop now. And we focus way too much on this concept of disease activity, as opposed to this overall disease severity, which is about the history of their disease, damage that they have had. The problem with this is patients come in and we talk about disease activity, which reflects the cross-sessional nature at that moment in time of how sick patients are. This is how we get patients into registration drug trials. This is why all the drug labels talk about moderate to severely active disease, but it takes nothing into account of their overall disease severity, which is really thinking about the longitudinal course from the beginning once they were diagnosed, and in many cases even pre-diagnosis, through current time of what the burden of that their disease is. Really what we're talking about here is the difference of how is your patient today when you see them in the office versus what's your patient's disease course been over the history since diagnosis, which I would argue is far more important. I saw a patient just a couple days ago that came in. When we asked him how he was doing, he said fine. However, when you looked at his history, it was a new referral to us. He had had six surgeries in the past. He had perianal disease in the past. He gets hospitalized once every few months. And today he was fine. By all definitions, he has very low disease activity. But this is not somebody that we're going to wait for until his next hospitalization, his next flare to treat. And we really have to shift our thinking away from activity and think more about overall disease severity. And this idea of risk stratification, of course, is not dichotomous, somebody who's complicated versus not complicated. There's this whole range in between of how quickly patients progress from when they start with very slow-moving disease, where honestly you have time. Not everybody needs top-down combination therapy. There are patients that we can watch for a period of time and even treat them symptomatically, seeing how they do early on, but keeping a close eye on to them, versus those patients that have immediately aggressive disease, where you don't have a year or two to see how how they do, you probably have a few months before they end up with their first hospitalization or even their first surgery. Mina talked about some of this, so I won't go into details. I think the AGA risk stratification is, is a very important first step in helping us understand these differences between low risk and high risk disease. The problem I have with these is not that it's not moving us in the right direction, it's that if you look at the high risk column 
Most of those things are things that have already happened to our patients that we can't reverse, like stricturing or penetrating disease, prior surgery. The others are really helpful and predictive, but we, we need to find a way to get this earlier on as opposed to waiting until bad things happen to say, oh yeah, that patient's a patient with high-risk disease, and we need to try to catch it a little bit early. So the question is, can we predict the future? And that's been a lot of the focus of the work I've done over the past couple of years of trying to understand, do we even have the ability to use the data that Mina referred to to help us make individualized predictions for patients? And even more important, can we turn that into a tool so that our patients help us understand? We might all sit here in the room and agree that a patient is in trouble or they will be in trouble soon, but that doesn't translate easily to a patient who isn't feeling that poorly in the clinic. And those are the patients, frankly, I worry about most in my practice. It's not the patients who come in sick. I know they're going to engage. They're going to take their medications. They're going to come back for follow-up. It's the patients who feel kind of eh, or they've gotten used to their disease, that they may or may not feel that it's so important to go on what they perceive as really, quote, strong therapy, which we interpret as effective and safe therapy. So this idea is, can we help patients understand the implications of their disease? And we don't want IBD patients to be too scared of their disease. Our goal is not to have our patients walking around every day thinking that the other shoe is going to drop any day now and they can't live their lives, go to graduate school, have a family, do all the things that they've dreamt to do, but we do probably need them a little more scared than they are. And once our patients are really comfortable that things are okay, and if they don't understand the fact that these diseases can be truly debilitating over years, then we're never going to engage them in ways that we need our patients engaged to be part of their care as opposed to just being passive recipients of their care. So we need to help them understand and respect the fact that these are irreversible, destructive diseases. And again, not just Crohn's disease, but patients with ulcerative colitis as well. And it's easy in Crohn's disease to think about the damage, but those patients with ulcerative colitis that have damage are those patients who've had UC for years, that have had smoldering mild disease, that you finally get them into complete remission and they're still having six, seven, eight loose bowel movements a day. That's not their IBS. That's their damage from the absorptive capacity of the colon that's been damaged over many years, and we also owe them, the, we, we have the responsibility to help them understand that they can get into trouble over time, even if they're early on in their disease and they don't see that. I've had a number of patients say to me when we've had conversations like this, when they already have an ostomy and they've gone, gone through multiple surgeries, if somebody had just told me how serious Crohn's disease could be soon after diagnosis, I would have had an entirely different outlook on those first five or 10 years when I was trying to avoid treatment and trying to stay off of biologic therapy or whatever the drug du jour that they were scared of at that time. So that led to the work that we did, which is trying to develop this patient communication tool to help patients understand and help us understand who the patients are that we should really be focusing on and the others that we might be able to take a different tactic. Uh, the way we did this is a simple modeling experiment uh, using Co Cox proportional analyses, using a 700 patient cohort to identify the variables that are most important. And these are the variables similar to what Mina said. It's not, we didn't make these variables up. It just turned out in our cohort of 700 people, it actually were the same variables that have come up with multiple studies that looked at these individual variables over time. The thing that drive this are location of disease, so small bowel disease is more complicating in patients with Crohn's disease than colonic disease, who typically have a more UC-like phenotype. There are serologic markers, as Mina mentioned, that do individually predict complications of disease. Specifically here, we looked at ASCA and CBER, which were predictive factors for complications, where ANCA, again, representing this UC-like phenotype, had less complicating disease. And in fact, NOD2 does show consistently that patients who are NOD2 positive have more small bowel stricturing disease, which will lead to potential surgery. So the complications we looked at were the time from diagnosis until they have their first complication of Crohn's disease. In this case, a stricture or internal penetrating disease that may or may not lead to a surgery. If you're interested in predictive modeling and, and how these models fit, we first did this in our cohort and you use something called a Harrell C or C statistic. And these 
CDC statistic came out to 0 0.73, 0 0.65, and higher is considered adequate or acceptable for these types of models. We we're actually very pleased with how this came out. A model always looks good in the group that you model it in, so you need to go to other cohorts and prove that it works in other groups of patients as well. And in fact, in a completely different adult cohort of patients and a pediatric cohort of patients, actually these predictions held up. So this is where the paper would have stopped if I wasn't interested in patient communication and trying to communicate this to patients, because I don't know about you, but I certainly can't sit with a patient and say, your hazard ratio is 4.12 because you have perianal disease, you better go on a biologic drug. But we wanted to convert this to something that we can really use. And in this case, we use something called system dynamics analysis, which is the methodology to address these inherent dynamic complexities between variables. It's not that different from multivariate logistic regression, but the difference is, and what makes it unique, is this real-time individualized prediction for a patient with a simple control panel and a simple output graph that I'll show you in a minute. And what's really cool about this is the ability to add new data to this over time. So typically, you would model something, you get stuck with your, your, your algorithm, and that's it. In this case, as new data emerge over time, we're able to apply that to this model and make it better. And really what we're trying to do is take complex clinical data and put this into a patient-friendly result. So this is a, a, an example of the output of this program called Prospect, which again uses the data, converts it into this using system dynamics analysis, and it's a personalized output. It wouldn't say example patient number one, it would say your patient's name on it. And you're able to see from time zero, or the day that you're seeing them in the office over the next three years, what their personalized risk is of developing a complication of Crohn's disease. Again, structuring disease, internal penetrating disease, which working with a lot of focus groups of patients, that's what they told us would most drive them towards going on appropriate therapy. And the intent of this is not to necessarily push them on more aggressive therapy, but to select the right patients for the right therapy. And we did this as part of a clinical trial, and I give you two examples just to show you that we did have been using this in clinical practice, and it was really helpful. This was a, a wonderful 28-year-old guy from Maine who's a musician who was starting his own recording studio, and he actually felt fine. He treated with uh, uh, the uh, monotherapy of what is a very common therapy now for these days in and I'd say medical marijuana, but it wasn't. It was just marijuana. And, and he had what we would all agree is moderately active ileal disease, and he felt fine, and he came to me, and for those who know northern New England uh, geography, getting there from north of Portland, Maine to Lebanon, New Hampshire, where Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center is is, is, is pretty much going down to Boston and then coming up to New Hampshire. So he drove uh, about uh, six hours to come see me that day and couldn't understand, I'm sorry, this is a Bangor, Maine, and couldn't understand why his doctor sent him for the second opinion because he was doing just fine. And I tried all my tricks and, and told him about complicating disease and all these things, and he really didn't seem that interested. And I said, wait, we have this new product that we're working on to really help patients understand this. And we put him through this model, and this is what his, uh, his output came to be. And I saw him on Monday on a clinic, and I lie not when I tell you that uh, on Friday when we, he got the results, he called my nurse and said, how soon can I start those biologic drugs you told me about? Because he then was a little bit scared. He had this different respect for the disease that was really different from before. And in fact, we put him on uh, combination therapy with adalimumab and methotrexate, and he did great. I actually just saw him back recently. He continues to do great. Uh, here's a different patient, a 20-year-old, amazing young woman who went to college in Vermont, who was in the varsity soccer team, played uh, a really high-level athlete, had two jobs, double major, all these things that make uh, you know, young people amazing. And she had mild to moderately active disease. She was also sent to me to, quote, talk some sense into her. She needs biologic therapy. And I met her. Uh, she was on monotherapy as well, uh, using uh, soccer. She said as long as she keeps playing soccer, she feels great. We put her through the model, and she also called me a few days later and said, ha ha, I told you I didn't need to be on therapy. And she interpreted this as something she could very much live with. And in fact, she went on what I call Vermont combination therapy, which was soccer plus supplements. And she also had complete mucosal healing and, and did fine. So again, we, we don't risk stratify just to push people on drugs. We risk stratify to understand where we can follow and be more careful. So uh, and just thinking about how do we pick drugs, it's not just a pyramid top to bottom or up and down. It's more like you know our, our famous uh, paintings where it's hard to tell which way we're going and it's not always such a straight line. But I would argue that these questions will really help us 
personalized treatment if we ask them for every patient and think about it. Number one, how much risk is this patient at of their disease? You can use something like Prospect. You can use the tools that uh, Mina told us about. I will tell you that we're working very hard now to get Prospect out there that could be free for all patients, including the serologic and genetic markers, and I hope to be able to announce soon that we're able to do that. Number two, what's the prior history of treatment? How many drugs have they tried? And why did they stop? I find so often that patients come in with a list of, I have failed this, until you realize they got one dose of whatever, and two weeks later they didn't feel good, so they stopped treatment and went on to something else. So please make sure you ask and understand why they stopped the drug. And even biologics, you can go back to and get away with that in many cases. What's the urgency of onset? Is this somebody teetering on hospitalization? Or is this somebody that you might have a few weeks or even a couple of months to try a drug that might have a slower onset? Are there extraintestinal or perianal manifestations that might drive certain treatments? Are there particular safety concerns? Are they young males that you're worried about hepatosplenic T-cell lymphoma? Are they pregnant? Are they older? Again, if you follow this sequence, you end up with a, a pretty clear understanding of which drugs might work better. And then what's really important, does the patient have a preference? And this is a question you should have before you make a recommendation to understand where things are going. Now, a very practical thing, and I hate to put this as the last one in red, which is will get paid for. And I hate nothing more than go through this whole sequence and have a patient tell me they really prefer this drug because I led them down that path only to find out it's not going to get paid for and we have very little argument to make a case for that. So please just be thoughtful about that as you move forward here. To wrap up over the next minute or two, I won't go through all the details of this, and, and you'll have these slides available. I was able to borrow this from uh, Dr. Ruggiero, who and, and adapted a little bit. But all of these categories have different things that go for why you would or what would not use those treatments. And if you match up this list and answers to those questions, that is personalized therapy. Again, we don't need any fancy microbiome work. We can understand what our individual patient experience has been with their disease and then pick drugs to match that. And we're getting much better at being able to do that. This is the future, and I promised you one slide to tell you. You may have seen this before, but this is using the drug that's actually making great headway now. I believe uh, uh, Bill Sanborn, or, or actually, no, Brian Fagan talked about this earlier, which is etrolizumab, which is an anti-beta-7 antibody. Uh, what they did is take biopsies from the colon, and depending on gene expression profiles, you could see that patients had up to almost an 80% response and remission rate, as opposed to those really low numbers otherwise. So we are getting there, and this is the kind of thing that we need to be doing with all of our drug trials to understand. So to wrap up here, we need to determine who's at high risk versus low risk. Again, not only to pick the most aggressive treatment, but which are the patients that we could follow more carefully and get away with not giving them immune suppressive therapy. Not every patient needs top-down or early intensive therapy. We need to ask the right questions from our patients. Our patients are telling us what drug we should put them on. We just have to ask the questions and listen to the answers. And we want to personalize a treatment plan based on individual factors. And finally, we need patients to engage in the process with us. This can't be us handing down a recommendation. This has to be something that you together come to.